Welcome to Christ Church Brentor for this said Eucharist on the sixth Sunday after Trinity. A very warm welcome to you all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Yes. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Father Eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and barred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the glory. Glory to God in the highest and, and peace, peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you, that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sit for the first reading. The first reading is from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of all the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from old and declared it? You are my 
eyewitnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We remain seated to say verses from Psalm 139. We say together, O Lord, you have searched me out and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark out my journeys and my resting place, and you are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go then from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me turn to night, even darkness is no darkness with you. The night is as clear as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. The second reading. The New Testament reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery before you have to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father except through me. Alleluia. Please stand for the Gospel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. 
Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we've just heard, St. Matthew records the parable of the weeds. It forms a twin parable with the parable of the mustard seed that follows, and we'll hear this next week. It seems a rather strange and challenging story. The interpretation of the parable depends on what we understand by the kingdom of God. Here, the kingdom of God is likened to good seed that is sown in a field. This one action is all that the man in the story did. In what follows, it's stressed that he is in no way involved with what happens next. The enemy came whilst he slept and sowed weeds, which in time appeared with the plants, and they too were amongst the ones that bore the grain. Weeds and good seed both together Good seed bears fruit, weeds growing amongst them. Already the point of the parable begins to emerge. The words used by Matthew, I think, require careful attention. The seed is not sown, sorry, the seed is sown, it's not thrown or scattered carelessly around on the ground as it was last week. Remember the story of the sower, or as I prefer to call it, the parable of the different sowings, carelessly thrown about without a thought. But in this story, the seed is sown deliberately and very carefully. Significantly, this is all the man does regarding the seed. His subsequent non-interference is emphatically stressed. He lets the good seed and the weeds grow together just in case the good seed is damaged, until that is the time of the harvest. So what's the point of this parable? Perhaps the kingdom of God is like the seed, something that germinates and develops deep within us. In this case, Jesus is the sower of the seed. 
He comes into the world as its creative principle. The man does nothing towards the growing of the seed, for he can hardly be expected to cause what he does not know. But it doesn't grow alone. That much is clear. So something else must be being said here. We need to look even more deeply to find Jesus' intended meaning. The parable may, as some commentators suggest, simply be about patience or about waiting for the harvest with confidence or even about non-belief in the coming of the harvest at all. But none of these explanations seem to me to have any firm foundation in the text. During the time of growth, man does nothing in the field. Everything happens without human intervention. Good seed and grain growing together. So perhaps the meaning of the parable is not to do with the man in any way, but rather has everything to do with the seed. Perhaps it is to do with the progressive and steady, often hidden and mysterious development of the kingdom of God in the world. If this is so, then this may be a parable about having confidence in the growth of the kingdom through which God's purpose is ultimately achieved. But just perhaps in the light of over 2,000 years of church history, we may think this is a slightly over-optimistic interpretation. Matthew 13 verse 30, I think, points us in yet another direction. The parable makes it clear that the seed must be allowed to grow without disturbance until the harvest. And then the sorting out of the good and the bad will take place. At the time of the harvest, when the grain is ripe, the seed is gathered and sorted and weeds are burned because the harvest has come, St Matthew records. This verse points us towards the end time, the last day. The kingdom of God is like the harvest and the rest of history subordinate to it. The most obvious point of the parable is the idea of good and evil coexisting in the present, but being separated in the future. As is so often the case, Jesus once again encourages us to look further afield, to raise our viewpoint, to look at the bigger picture of God's activity in the world. Now we know that God's activity in the world through Jesus isn't some cataclysmic event in the future. We know that because it's a present reality. It's not as if we're waiting for God to come and act quickly or shortly, because that has already happened. It's a present fact. In his own coming, something decisive has already taken place that had never happened before and that will never happen again. Now the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is in our midst. If only we could see it, and if only we could believe in it. And the parable makes it clear. On the one hand, we mustn't act as if that kingdom never came, hasn't come, isn't here. Nor should we act in a way that we believe it's already fully here. We live, as has been said before, consciously in between the times, between the beginning and the end time. The parable was and is, I believe, addressed to people, exactly people like us, who live between the times of the realisation of God's full purposes. And what this parable makes absolutely clear 
is that this is not a case of human intervention or human calculation. God is at work. In the face of human suffering and despair, this may make little sense. But in this parable, good and evil coexist. Those who hear the parable in confidence that the kingdom of God is already a present reality, despite all those metaphorical weeds in the world, those forces which seek to undermine the good purposes of God's sowing, receive a different kind of hope. Because we believe that the redemption of this world has already begun, that our salvation has already been won for us, promise and hope, rather than darkness and despair, will always be characteristic marks of any Christian community in the face of any kind of evil whatsoever. And that's not true only of community, it's true of each of our lives. We have a different type of confidence, a different hope in God's good purposes. The full realisation of God's kingdom, the time of harvest, is still to come. We live, as I said, between the times, and that redemption will not be complete until God's kingdom comes in all its fullness. The good seed grows because it is of God. Well, what does that mean for you and me? I think it means that we can never identify any existing state of affairs in the world, suffering or injustice, darkness or despair, poverty or disease, pandemic or war, with the kingdom of God because that kingdom has not yet been fully realised. And it means, I think, most significantly, that we should strive to live in a certain way, a way that shows the world that promise and hope are the hallmarks of our lives and the hallmarks of our community. And isn't that exactly what we've been trying to do across our benefice since the outbreak of the coronavirus and lockdown. When we begin to question how we live, we enter into a new world of Christian life. If we live between the times, then Christian ethics have to be a between the times ethic. The problem is that there's always a strong temptation to adopt an ethic of gloom based on the fact that our redemption had not been won. Or, of course, the ethics of glory, as if the kingdom of God is already fully here. Neither are true. We live with an in-between times ethic to which this parable refers. It's marked by realism, the promise and hope of God's good purposes fully being revealed. For me, this parable clarifies the connection between the activity of believers, your activity and mine, in a world yet to be fully redeemed. And the final realisation of God's kingdom, perhaps, may happen tomorrow. We don't know. All these things are in God's hands. But just as we read the parable last week, the message is very timely. We have two aspects of the kingdom of God. The here and the now, the present reality and the future. The joys and wonders of the kingdom can be experienced in this life and anyone, anyone can experience them. And that's a wonderful message. Turn to Christ, recognise God's kingdom is a present reality and live in Christ. And this parable prompts us to question how we do that for the common good and for our own flourishing 
as Christians. So I want to thank you here for what's been happening since lockdown. The way that new ways have been found to share the gospel message through the use of social media, YouTube, Facebook, the website. For those of you who have been telephoning others or perhaps receiving a call, for the letters which have gone out from my office and from other places, for the casual conversation in the park, whatever it's been, I believe God's kingdom remains a present reality and that we are finding new ways to share all of that with others. And yes, we do that in a complicated, mixed up world. We really do. But it is of God and ultimately it will prosper. And where mistakes are made, we will put them right. But the message of this parable is absolutely clear. We must understand the kingdom is a present reality and we should see that bigger picture of hope, the challenge of living with an in-between-the-times ethic. For I believe that when we do that, we will quickly come to understand that we are the means by which God's kingdom is fully realised. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the power of the Spirit, and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Good morning. The response we're using this morning for our prayers is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray together. God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is no one like you. You are the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. We thank you too that you made us in your image to have free will and that our decisions and choices have an impact and matter. Please teach us to walk in your way and help us to make wise decisions that lead to life. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We thank you that you gave your son for us, Jesus, to show us who you are and to enable us to have a relationship with you. We are sorry for all the times we get things wrong. Please forgive us. We thank you that you are gracious and merciful, full of compassion and slow to anger. Bear with us as we try to learn to love others as you love them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you our current circuit situation with the ongoing pandemic. We pray for all those in leadership as they seek to do what is best for us and the country as a whole. Please support them and give them wisdom. We pray also for the key workers and others who go out each day to do difficult or critical roles, often unnoticed, but essential to our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We think too of all the children and teenagers, teachers and parents who have come to the end of this academic year. It has been a very challenging time for them and we pray you will keep them safe over the summer holidays as they have a break. Help them to rest and enjoy their time in preparation for returning to nursery, school and college, even though what this will look like is still uncertain. We also pray for all the holiday makers and visitors, especially to West Devon. Please help them to be considerate, behave sensibly, and to not increase the spread of coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We also remember those who we know who are struggling or ill at this time, and those who have asked for our prayers. We pray for Mick, for Sally, for Chris Figers, for Nick and Julie, for Dave and Wendy, for Heather, for Sally and Jim, for Mark and Kelly and their family, for Edward, 
for Michael, for Jim and for Andrew. We also pray for all those receiving treatment for cancer and those awaiting hospital appointments. And we remember the recently departed and pray for their family and friends, especially David Brimacon, who lived his whole life in Brentor and was buried here at Christchurch this week, and for John Roderick, whose funeral is tomorrow. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Finally, when we leave here today, Lord, give us the strength and courage and energy to do the things you are calling us to do. Give us the words to say when we have difficult conversations and are asked difficult questions. And help our actions to be gentle, kind and loving to those we interact with. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Amen. Let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand, please. Conscious of your personal bubbles and the use of elbows. <laughs> God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God, forever. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us, and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will, and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you, and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, holy silence in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, holy silent in the highest.
Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same night that he is betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. And so far, the calling to mind his death on the cross. His perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. No, we are many. We, we are one body, body because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be good. you please stand. The body of Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were so far off, you met us in your Son and daughter's home. Dying and living, he declared your love gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to us. We who in the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise his life. invite Helen to come forward now to give the notices before the final blessing. That's better. <laughs> Several notices today. First of all, this evening, um, Mike Loder is taking our evening service up on the tour at six o'clock. And anybody who feels like a walk up there, it is very, very beautiful up there now and the swallows are doing very well. Tomorrow evening at 7.30, we are continuing our home group, our virtual home group now. And if anybody would like to join us, Tony's leading us um, and Michael and Amanda are sort of hosting it sort of electronically, I believe. Um, so that's at 7.30 tomorrow. Um, we're looking at acts and I'm finding out a lot more I didn't know, which is good. On Tuesday evening, we have a um, PCC meeting. So if, if anybody's got any comments or anything that they'd like to, us to raise, please let me or David know, um, either by email or today, however. Um, next Saturday, we have got a clear up in the church. Now, the churchyard actually looks beautiful partly because of the grand work of Rob at the back there. So thank you, Rob, um, and also some other people. But Kate, always on for perfection. We're going to have the best churchyard in the county at this rate. It is looking very, very good. And the funeral directors told me so actually on Thursday at David Brimacombe's funeral, which was lovely. And for those of you who knew David Brimacombe, if you live in the village, you will have known him, seen him around. Um, when he was buried, um, all the mourners, it was a small family funeral, all the mourners put earth and rosemary in for remembrance of him. I went last as verger, and on behalf of all his friends and neighbours, I put some earth and some rosemary in on behalf of all of us for the work that he did in Brentall Village. Um, Lastly, rotors for readings and for flowers. So if anybody's able to help, please could you let me know. Um, the flowers are lovely. They were done for David's funeral and they've got lots of hedgerow flowers in, brambles because he loved picking blackberries, honeysuckle um, from the hedgerows, all the work that he used to do round and about the village in memory of him. Now, before we come to the words of final blessing, <coughs> last but not least, we're very fortunate to have with us today here for the first time in Christchurch here at uh, Brentor, uh, Rosie Illingworth, who has joined as an assistant curate. You may have seen the broadcasts which Rosie's done on our Facebook page and YouTube and lots of other places, but you may not have. So I've invited Rosie just to say a few words by way of, of introduction to you all this morning. Um, I know she'll get to know you in time goes by, but Rosie, the lectern is all yours. It's dangerous to give me a lectern, you never know what I'm going to say. Um, thank you so much for the welcome that I've already received. Um, it's been really good to get to get to know people gradually. Um, I've been in Whitchurch for about a month now, um, so that's been good. 
Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in rural Northamptonshire in a little village called Waddenhoe, um, which uh, there's a slight, very minuscule connection to Brentor um, because we had a church on the top of a hill, not quite as tall a hill um, as your tour, um, called St Michael's. Uh, so that made me smile when I realised that link. Um, but I grew up going to the Baptist church in the nearby town um, with my parents and my younger sister. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I was about 18 or 19 that I began to really uh, build a connection with the Anglican Church uh, when I did a year working for Lawn Abbey, which is a retreat house in rural Leicestershire. Um, started leading services, getting to know people, having conversations about faith and life. Um, and it's that point that I started thinking maybe ordained ministry was something that I might be being called to. Um, after that, I went to Exeter to study theology at university um, and really loved being able to uh, explore all the big questions about God and life, the universe and everything. Um, after that, I spent a year working in Coventry for the Bishop of Coventry. Uh, trying to work out how a diocese works. As Chris has pointed out to me, no one knows how a diocese works. And I think that's what I learned, but somehow it does. Um, I then missed Exeter far too much and came back and worked for the NHS for a couple of years in administration. Um, and for the last three years, I've been up in Durham training for ordination. I am partway through a research master's at the moment uh, so the thesis is due in at the end of September so fingers crossed we'll get that in in time. Uh, apart from that uh, in my free time I am loving the fact that the moor is so close to my house uh, walking and running up there has been glorious uh, hanging out with uh, friends at an appropriately social distance um, and uh, playing board games. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Uh, thank you for the welcome, as I've said before, um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you all in due course. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosie, and welcome once again. It's a delight to have you with us. When I was Rosie's age, the answer to those big questions about life and the news, it used to be 42. Is that no longer the case? <laughs> <laughs> Would you please stand? <laughs> Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.